This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you are enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. This is going to be Chapter 22, Vascular Disorders. Key Concepts Upon completion of this chapter, you will understand the classification of extremity pain as an emergency, is an emergency or a chronic condition, how identifying the patient's emergency conditions is key to field care. Chief concern. Greatest concerns with vascular disorders um, are emergent conditions causing non-traumatic extremity pain, a uh, condition putting the limb in jeopardy. Acute vascular occlusion. Blood vessel is occluded or the inner diameter is acutely reduced. Um, flow past the obstruction is very minimal. Acute arterial inclusion Embolus lodges in the vessel and includes the arterial supply to an extremity. Uh, collateral circulation, a network of smaller vessels that can keep the blood flowing to the extremity around an injury or occlusion. Veno thromboembolus, uh, blood pools and is at risk for developing a clot or thrombus in that extremity. Uh, the deep vein thrombosis is a veno thromboemboli occurring in deeper, larger extremity veins. Figure 22.1, mechanism for an acute arterial occlusion. You never know what the patient has as far as atherosclerotic plaque. So if the passageway is narrowed, then a very small embolus can occlude it. So that means everything that is distal, if this was the oxygenated end and this was to the tissue, Everything distal to that has a decreased blood supply. Uh, so A, embolus occludes a narrowed peripheral vessel. B, a patient with atrial fibrillation embolizes a clot from the heart, which lodges in a narrowed vessel. Now, the problem with the atrial fibrillation is, so whenever we look at this up here, the heart's just kind of quivering. So it doesn't really flow blood well over the processes. So there's a possibility in some individuals, that's why we like to cumidize them, that if they develop a clot, especially in the left atrium, that it will go into the left ventricle and then out to the body. Now, since the heart feeds itself right off of the aortic semilunar valve, we have a 50-50 shot. First 50%, it, may, it probably will resemble a stroke. The other 50%, it could be a heart attack, depending on the size of the clot. And then C, uh, in, an, in an abdominal aortic dissection, the intimal layer or the innermost lining flap occludes the iliac artery. So we have all types of aneurysms, ones that blow out. This one here, the inter layer, the inside layer, or the intimal layer of the vessel sloughs off. So that sloughing, there's tissue now in that layer, and what that tissue does is it occludes blood supply. To the distal areas. Let's this off here. Fractures, uh, common causes as well. Uh, most result from extremity trauma, pathological fracture, uh, requires only a minimal force, things like osteoporosis. So consideration on a person with fractures, age and calcium content, uh, examples of this would be osteoporosis consideration, cancer and tumors. Uh, the tumor, if it's developing in the bone, disrupts the bone's ability to bear weight, producing a fracture. Slipped capital femoral epithesis, and this generally happens in adolescent individuals. Uh, injury affecting adolescence that produces leg pain and the growth plate essentially slips. This is figure 22.2 and 22.3.
um, 22.2 sections of a long bone. So it's very vascular. It's where we make red blood cells. When a bone fractures, very simply, the fracture itself can bleed. Um, it could the sharp ends of the bone could lacerate vessels, causing an occlusion, all kinds of good stuff. Um, as far as figure 22.3, this is a slip femoral capital epithesis. This is how it normally should look. But this one here has broken free and kind of grew back crooked. Uh, most of the time, they'll go in and apply Steinman's pins to this and surgically repair it. Uh, soft tissue infections, things like cellulitis, um, infection of the superficial layers of the skin. Considerations, uh, erythema or area of redness. Lymph angitis or streaking. <coughs> <coughs> Soft tissue infections, uh, cellulitis, infection of the superficial skin layers. Considerations on this are erythema, areas of redness, lymphangitis or streaking, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, deeper soft tissue infection, and this can be life-threatening. Uh, flexor tenosynovitis, which is infection of the tendons in the hand and forearm. Uh, cutaneous abscess, formation of a collection of pus just underneath the skin, perantia, uh, cutaneous abscess located around the nail bed, uh, most often in the hand. And we're going to look at two figures here, figure 22.4, which is cellulitis, and figure 22.5, which is necrosis, or necrotizing fasciitis. This is cellulitis, so we're looking at the reddened areas here, streaking. And then this is, all of this here is dead tissue, necrotizing fasciitis. Both of these can cause septicemia in your patient, depending on how widespread the infection gets. Bone and joint infections. Uh, surface infections can spread to the bone, causing osteomyelitis. Uh, and they can spread to the tissues inside the joint space, causes specific arthritis or septic joints. Rhabdomyolysis, um, which is essentially the breakdown of muscle, often associated with crush injuries, electrical injuries, or prolonged soft tissue compression and it has a variety of causes, uh, exercise to the point of muscle breakdown. Medications can cause rhabdo. Uh, muscle contraction resulted, uh, resulting from restraint. So if we have the patient restrained and they're continuously contracting, trying to get out of those restraints, they can cause rhabdo as well. Pathophysiology of chronic causes of extremity pain. They include arthritis or joint inflammation, Osteoarthritis, uh, which is cartilage that cushions the bones, making up of the joint. It wears out and becomes thin. Rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory disease where the body's immune system attacks both the tissue and the capsule surrounding the joints, as well as the cartilage within the joint. Gout, a common form of inflammatory arthritis caused by deposits of uric acid crystals in the joint, fluid in the joint, or fluid in the joint capsule. Bursitis, bursal sac inflammation, often results from repetitive motion and stress on the joint.
tendon inflammation, often caused by minor injury or repetitive motion of the joint. And then fibromyalgia includes muscle pain, digestive disorders, chronic headaches, and sleep disorders. Cardinal symptom of fibromyalgia is exhaustion that is coupled with muscle pain. And figure 22.10, we're going to look at the bursal sac here in just a second. And this is the bursa, which essentially uh, reduces friction and supports the tendons in the moving joint. As far as history, considerations, circumstances leading to the onset. So we use the OPQRST mnemonic, obtain the time of onset, events preceding the onset of pain, the location, the quality, if it reoccurs or it radiates or if there's any relieving factors, and the severity on the pain on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you ever felt in your life. What would you say this pain is to you right now? Past medical and surgical histories, if they're diabetic, what medications they're on, if they have osteoporosis, are they in atrial fibrillation, or have they had any sort of vascular bypass? On examination, the primary assessment, identify and manage immediate life-threatening conditions. Detailed physical exam, including extremity inspection and palpation, assess the range of motion, and compare skin color and temperatures. If the limb is asphyxiated, it will be cooler and not have as much color to it. Capillary refill might be your first indication. Assessment. <clears throat> Indicators of acute arterial occlusion would be things like leg pain, vascular problems, absence of trauma, atrial fibrillation, their borderline tachycardia can have an irregularly irregular rhythm, diabetes, and hypertension. Treatment. Treatment of acute extremity pain as support and comfort. Ice, extremity position, and that would be elevation, analgesic medications, and appropriate treatments for other conditions if found. Evaluation. During transport, vital signs are reassessed at least once. Includes the patient's level of pain. Reassessed additionally depending on the transport length and the condition of the patient. Disposition. Patient with unstable vital signs transport to the nearest emergency department. Suspected surgical intervention may be required. Uh, bring directly to the emergency department or consult online medical control. In conclusion, the underlying cause of extremity pain can range from benign and bothersome to limb or life-threatening conditions. Early indication or identification of the limb threatening conditions by the paramedic speeds treatment for the patient and improves the chances of saving the patient's limb. References of this were taken from Myers Paramedic Volume 2, Medical Emergencies of Delmar Learning. And if you have any questions concerning this chapter, feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith, roy.smith at redlandcc.edu or 405-219-7613. Thank you.